Curing cancer is the holy grail of medicine. Many researchers have spent their lives pursuing it. Many more have sought significantly better treatments. Doctors study cancer's vulnerability so they can attack it when it happens. And they try to understand why cancer happens in the first place. So someday they can prevent it. Normally, cells will divide when they need to and then stop growing. In the case of cancer, though, what happens is the cells continue to divide over and over and over again, and they've lost the ability to stop growing. That's Dr. Joshua Schiffman, professor of pediatric hematology and oncology at the University of Utah and an investigator at the Huntsman Cancer Institute there. Over the course of a lifetime, about 40% of people will develop cancer, But what many people don't realize is that the first steps towards cancer are happening in our bodies all the time, but they don't get that far. Every day, just walking down the street, we are getting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of mutations, but our body is designed to actually eliminate those so that we don't go on to develop cancer. Although even so, half of all men and a third of all women will develop cancer throughout their lifetime. And as we get older, our ability to fix those mutations and the accumulation of those mutations that sneak by our DNA repair system begins to grow. And if you live long enough, there unfortunately is a pretty good chance that you may develop cancer. Cells are dying in your body all the time, so your body needs to replace those dead cells. So, you know, every time a cell dies, it's replaced more or less with another healthy cell. And sometimes that process goes awry, and a cell, it's not quite cancer all the way, but it's precancerous. And your body's immune system, for example, might recognize that precancerous cell as not being quite right and sort of mount an immune response against it and kill it. Dr. Vincent Lynch is an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the State University of New York at Buffalo. Sometimes that process doesn't happen and those cells escape, for example, that immune surveillance. And then they start to mutate in ways that makes it much harder for your body to recognize them as foreign. And that allows them to escape the normal mechanisms that keep uncontrolled cell proliferation in check. Why the immune system fails to detect those mutations is the subject of a great deal of research. As Schiffman says, age may often have something to do with it. But obviously, sometimes it doesn't. Why would children get cancer? Because this is really an interesting question, right? Why would someone so young develop cancer at such an early age? They haven't lived long enough to accumulate all of those mutations that happens in time and all of the environmental exposure. So we believe that there's a strong genetic component that contributes to the risk of childhood cancer. And we're trying to understand exactly what that component is. Schiffman says a few children have a genetically weakened immune system. Their DNA repair mechanisms themselves are mutated, so the rate of developing cancer is very high. When cancer develops in any of us, a similar failure has occurred. There are over 22,000 different genes that we have as humans, and each gene has a very specific job. And if those genes get altered, changed, or mutated, then the instructions that those genes code no longer can be read, and that gene can't perform its job. And some of these genes, their job really is only to protect us from cancer. And if you start losing those genes, then you've lost your protection for cancer. Lynch and Schiffman say one of the principal cancer protection genes in the body is called P53, or TP53. It's so important that some people call it the guardian of the genome. When a cell starts to go awry, when a cell starts to have a mutation or turn into a precancer so that there's a spelling mistake in its DNA, P53 shows up on the scene and helps to fix it. It's almost like a big spell checker. So basically, it's hanging out in your cell all the time, doing nothing. And then if your cell experiences DNA damage, it does two things. It starts a stopwatch, which gives the cell time to repair the damage. So normally, cells are dividing, and it stops the cell from dividing until the damage is repaired. The thing is, it's counting. It's not giving the cell an infinite amount of time to repair the damage. If it takes too long to repair the damage, it causes the cell to kill itself. And sort of the biological rationale there is, If there's only a little bit of damage, your cell can probably repair that without there being much of a side effect. But if there's a lot of damage, chances are the cell isn't going to be able to repair all of that damage very faithfully. So it can repair some of the damage correctly, but some of the damage may escape that repair. And if that's the case, it's better to just kill the cell. 
But when those cancer protection genes or the tumor suppressor genes, when they get mutated or they don't work properly anymore, then there's nothing protecting us from developing cancer. The cells have lost their first line of defense. Some animals, however, have a first line of defense that seems to never fail. For example, about only 3% of elephants ever get cancer, and Schiffman and Lynch say that flies in the face of what you'd expect of a large animal. Elephants are 100 times the size of people. That means they have 100 times as many cells, which is actually, if you think about it, 100 times as many chances for randomly developing those mutations. Not only that, elephants live quite a long time. They live 50, 60, sometimes 70 years. That many cells dividing decade after decade after decade, just by chance alone, all elephants should actually be dropping dead of cancer, but they almost never do. There's no relation between body size and the incidence of developing cancer. And on one level, the answer is really simple. These big things have just evolved ways to reduce their cancer risk. And on another level, the answer is really complicated. It's, well, okay, how are they doing that? How they are doing that has been the subject of both Schiffman and Lynch's research, examining the elephant genome. Their separate studies in the Journal of the American Medical Association and the journal eLife show that that answer is pretty clear. Instead of two copies of that P53 gene we were talking about, all humans have two copies, one from their mother, one from their father. Instead of two copies to protect them from cancer, elephants had 40 copies, so 20 times as many copies as people. That could create in elephants a theoretically nearly fail-safe cancer surveillance system. One way that an organism could increase its cancer resistance is just have lots of extra copies of P53. So if one of them becomes mutated and non-functional, there's backup redundant copies that can take over the role of the normal copy. Lynch found extra P53 genes in skin cells of both Asian and African elephants from the San Diego Zoo. Schiffman took a similar route seeking elephants' blood cells. I found myself at the local Utah Hogel Zoo. Whenever blood was being drawn, again, for other reasons, we were able to get some of it to our lab and study it. And sure enough, what we learned was that these extra copies of P53 indeed seem to be contributing to the ability of the elephant cell to rapidly remove any type of pre-cancer that was occurring. Schiffman put the elephant cells into a lab dish and exposed them to radiation and chemotherapy, prompting DNA damage to make them precancerous. And he did the same thing with human cells to compare how they worked. And what we found was that always the elephant cells were much more sensitive to the DNA damage. They were able to eliminate those cells with the cancer in it much more quickly. And we were able to demonstrate that the way they were doing that was they were activating this P53 system of cell death. And so the elephants, we were able to say, had evolved a much more robust system for eliminating cells that have DNA damage and can go on to form cancer. And this actually makes a lot of sense if you think about it from the perspective of an elephant. They're so large, so many cells, they can't afford to get cancer because they would go extinct. That research is going one step further now with the goal of turning elephant P53 into something that can help people. We're trying to figure out, is there a way that we could actually somehow deliver this elephant P53 to actually give to our patients to maybe treat or perhaps even one day prevent cancer? And this is the focus of our efforts right now. And what's the best way to get the elephant P53 into a human cancer cell in a dish and then eventually to go on and maybe in the future, who knows, make a medicine that could be given to people. Schiffman's team has exposed seven different kinds of human cancer cells to elephant P53 with dramatic results. The cancer cells shrivel and explode, killed by the elephant P53. Similar to if you put human P53 into a cancer cell, we're able to actually 
use uh, laboratory techniques to put the elephant P53 into it and observe the effects in some of these cancer cells. And we're able to show that some of these cancer cells in a dish are actually exploding, undergoing apoptosis. They actually shrivel up and go into that death cycle and then just basically turn into little small pieces that finally uh, disappear. So it's really very early, but it's still very uh, encouraging. But if extra P53 is so protective, Lynch asks, why are elephants about the only animals that have it? If this was such a great answer to solving the cancer problem, why haven't all the other animals that we looked at, and we looked at maybe a hundred of them, why don't they have extra copies of P53? If this was such an easy solution to cancer resistance, they should have extra copies as well. And the fact that they don't suggests that there might be some trade-off that goes along with having extra copies of P53. And there are some experimental data from mouse models that suggest that as well. So people have been making mice have cancer for the last you know, 20, 30 years in order to study cancer treatments. And when you make a mouse which has extra copies of P53, there are some side effects. So one of the side effects is that the males undergo reproductive senescence early. So they stop reproducing earlier than normal males. Um, and that would seem like it should be a pretty harsh trade-off. Evolution really cares about reproduction. So it doesn't really matter if you are an organism that never gets cancer if you never have any offspring. So there are almost certainly trade-offs. Other studies that engineered extra P53 into mice show that they age quickly, at least when the P53 is turned on all the time. They didn't get cancer, but they quickly got old in other ways. That doesn't happen if mice are engineered so their P53 is active only in the presence of DNA damage. But genetically engineering everyone's immune system doesn't seem to be a likely strategy, at least not in the short run. Schiffman says the more likely route will be to try to create a medicine using elephant DNA. Can we actually figure out a way to take this elephant P53 and make a medicine out of it to help our patients, to help treat cancer that they have, or maybe one day in the way future to even prevent cancer, just like the elephants don't have cancer. We want to figure out a way. How can we make it so that people don't have to get cancer again? You can find more information about Dr. Vincent Lynch, Dr. Joshua Schiffman, and all of our guests on our website, RadioHealthJournal.org. The segment originally aired in May 2017 and was written and produced by Reed Pence. Our lead producer is Kristen Farah. Our executive producer is Amira Zaveri. I'm Elizabeth Westfield. Westfield.